Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and welcome to YouGov's latest COVID-19 webinar. My name is Will Alstein and I'm going to take you through this afternoon in the next 45 minutes an overview from uh, the story of COVID so far and what we've seen through the lens of brands, uh, how audiences um, are impacted um, and what we are seeing in terms of future behaviour. We do have a chat function um, within this app, so please do use this. We will have time for questions at the end. Um, do note them down as we go, and we will go through as many of them as we possibly can at the end. Just so you don't have to scribble endless notes, uh, we will uh, be circulating a copy of this deck afterwards, um, as well as a recording. So uh, please don't feel as though you have to um, uh, uh, request those um, individually, that will come automatically. I'm also gonna be joined at the end of our session um, by YouGov's Director of Marketing Insights, Mickey Stacey. Um, Mickey and his team spend all of their time looking at the plethora of data that we have within our systems. Um, uh, and he's a guru when it comes to answering sort of more technical questions. Um, uh, and so he's gonna join me at the end. Right, enough of the housekeeping, um, let's get on with it. So as I said, what we're gonna talk about is brand performance. We're gonna look at some of the brands that have performed tremendously well. Um, over this last couple of months, we're going to look at a couple of examples of brands that have not done so well. We're then going to look at the um, impact that COVID-19 has had on audiences. Um, we're going to look at um, who, especially leaning on our economic confidence data. Um, so we're going to look at um, which groups have, um, have fared particularly badly um, and, uh, and what their outlook is. And then we're going to come on in the final section, um, more of a forward looking piece, looking at future behavior. So um, what have we seen? How does that relate to purchase intent? Um, and what are the trends that have been accelerated as a result of COVID-19? But let me just um, start out um, as we do all of our webinar series. We're just making it absolutely clear what YouGov's priority is at this time. When the pandemic broke, Stefan Shakespeare, our CEO, um, made a statement that YouGov's priority right now is about serving the public good. And by that, what he means is giving everyone around the world the ability to contribute to the discussion and have their voice heard, to then aggregate that data in a meaningful way and deliver data to those organizations that are making a difference. And let me talk about therefore though that um, data set in particular. So that is um, our behavioral data. It is designed primarily for public health organizations and policymakers, um, and looks at uh, health data, looks at uh, symptoms, looks at compliance with government policy. It's a survey run across 29 countries and is made in conjunction with Imperial College London, in particular, the um, Institute of Global Health Innovation. All of that data for the first time is being made open source and publicly available um, via two methods. Um, if you want to download it, you can at GitHub and there is a link um, at the bottom of that slide. Um, and it's also available if you're into your dashboards via COVID Data Hub, um, where you can explore the Tableau dashboards. Please do go and have a look at it. Um, it's fascinating data um, and we presented a really interesting webinar on it last week. We also have our public data. Um, our public data um, is data that YouGov puts out through its articles, um, through its interactive graphs um, and is available on our website. The um, uh, link is there at the bottom of that column. That covers things around fear of contracting the virus, uh, impacts, support for government um, uh, and various other measures um, across 27 countries. And then we come on to our commercial offer. So this is our consumer monitor which is designed for clients. It covers two elements. Um, one is around consumer behaviour and the other is looking at economic confidence and recovery. 
It's available via subscription. If you're interested, then please do um, get in touch. Info at yougov.com. But today, what we're going to do is we're going to lean on multiple sources of YouGov data uh, in order to tell the story so far. So when we're looking at brand, um, we'll be leaning on Brand Index. It's our global syndicated brand tracking data set. Um, we're also going to look into profiles to understand audiences. We're going to use some of our work we've run through our custom research team looking at uh, our debt tracker. Um, we're also going to use uh, some data in here that is taken from our self-service platform, YouGov Direct, um, and from Real Time, which is our very quick custom surveys that are designed for speed. So I'm going to bring all of this together um, in hopefully a, uh, a seamless way as we uh, move from story to story. But let's start with brand performance. Now, for some organizations um, and for some consumers, um, they think that many brands are actually misfiring in terms of their communication. It's too frequent um, with their audiences and it's not cutting through. About 51% um, of the UK population believes that to be the case. Also worryingly, about 43% um, agree that brands' current messages and advertising are not authentic. So there's too much communication of the wrong type going on. And when they mean inauthentic, what is it? Well, it's most likely message fatigue that's creeping in. We ran a survey asking uh, what people thought of uh, various words um, that were commonly used across advertising campaigns. Um, and things like all in this together, unprecedented, the new normal, um, are all words that consumers believed are overused um, and they're tired of hearing. I'm sure we've all seen that wonderful chart that's circulating on social media um, that uh, shows uh, the unprecedented use of the word unprecedented. Um, and I think that is, uh, that is symptomatic of what we're hearing um, from consumers. Um, for brands, it's a, not necessarily about words, um, but it's about their actions. Because if we look at some of the brands that have seen significant improvement in their brand performance. It is actions, not the words, um, that they have been taking. What I'm showing you on screen now is Admiral Car Insurance um, and their buzz score as tracked by Brand Index against the insurance category norm. And what you can see on the purple line is a significant spike in the buzz around Admiral following their announcement um, that they were going to deliver cash back to their customers. Um, and they went through a very simple exercise. They said, um, with people in lockdown, people are driving less, less people on the roads means less accident, less accidents means uh, less claims. That means that we as a company are doing better but we're not going to profiteer from that um, and they gave back to their customers or uh, are doing so at the moment because they promised it for the end of May uh, 110 million pounds um, as part of a stay at home refund but it's not just their buzz that increased what we also tracked was that this had cut through. They got significant attention. Their attention score increased by 25 points. Their word of mouth exposure that we track increased by 30 points. And their customer satisfaction was up by just under 14 points. So when we say action, that's what we mean. And most likely Admiral will think that that's 110 million pounds well spent because when it comes to premium renewals, um, people will likely remember this. Another brand um, that came out with actions was Burberry. Um, Burberry, uh, of course, um, uh, clothing, apparel, uh, at the luxury end. 
And they made a very clear statement um, about they were cutting directors' pay, they refused to furlough staff, um, and were donating PPE. We saw similar gains to that of Admiral um, for Burberry, um, particularly around um, buzz or word of mouth. But there are some brands um, that haven't got it quite right. And one of those in particular um, was Just Giving, which there was um, a, uh, a number of news stories circulating about the fees that they were going to collect following Colonel Tom Moore's 100th birthday walk. Now, even the Prime Minister got involved and urged the charity to reflect on its fees. But it's a familiar story that, we're, that we've seen and heard here. It's not the first time that a charity um, or a for-profit for good organisation has been criticised for its uh, operations. Um, and it's certainly not the first time that Just Giving has been uh, criticised uh, from this either. Um, and with false claims around two millions in fees um, circulating on the internet, their scores both for, uh, for reputation, for recommendation and consideration of the flat platform have plummeted. Reputation in particularly hard hit from going from just over 26 points um, to just over 12. And I think the the lesson here is to get ahead of the story. Um, if it's a familiar one that's repeated, um, then they're good news of they were donating also 100,000 to charity and actually the fees were significantly less and only a tiny fraction of the total funds raised. Um, should have, they should have got out there much, much earlier um, and on the front foot. But I think it's, uh, it's only fair to also talk about the supermarkets. And this is a good news story. Supermarkets really have had to step up. Um, and particularly, uh, the big four have made a massive effort um, in supporting the nation, supporting key workers, um, preventing um, uh, an extended period of panic buying when it could have run away um, with itself. Um, although, of course, that didn't stop um, runs on various product lines. But they've all made significant strides and taken action um, uh, and communicated that well with their customers. What they've seen as a result um, is, and again, I'm showing brand index buzz scores um, over a four week moving average versus the category norm. And what you can see here is that Tesco, as the Sainsbury's and Morrison's have all seen significant increases in their buzz since March. But why is that? Well, the supermarkets made um, several big announcements, whether that be um, uh, supporting the local community, uh, whether that be donating food, uh, or labour um, uh, or specific hours to um, specific groups um, for shopping. Um, but they have been a, a force for good and it has been seriously reflected um, in their scores. In particular, if we look at the impression scores uh, of those big four, um, well, Morrison's was uh, very quickly out the traps. Um, uh, when it was making uh, demands for three and a half thousand new jobs and pledged to say pay uh, sick pay um, to all employees. Um, uh, round to um, Tesco, um, which started indexing slightly later um, uh, as we got towards the end of April um, with their 30 million pound community package support. Um, but all of this, of course, um, means nothing if it doesn't translate into sales. Um, um, what is uh, evident from our data is that consideration scores for those big four um, uh, not, um, not necessarily have jumped significantly, but the rank order um, of the big grocers has shifted. 
So Sainsbury's has moved up from um, uh, third to second. Um, Asda has entered the top five over the course of the period. Um, Aldi has traded places with Sainsbury's and Lidl um, has actually dropped out of the top five. So there are some uh, examples of brand performance. Those that have got it right, um, those that have taken action, those that haven't necessarily got it right, and some examples of uh, messages that aren't necessarily cutting through and certainly words that aren't cutting through at this time. What I'd like to go on to talk about now is about audiences. Um, how is the consumer feeling? Um, how have they been impacted? Um, and then um, uh, you know, which groups in particular um, does that relate to? We track um, uh, one of, um, a num we run a number of public trackers um, here at YouGov. And one of them um, in particular is tracking the mood of the nation. Uh, and our data for this goes back um, a considerable way. But what we're showing here um, is um, moved from uh, the end of January um, up to this week. What uh, I am uh, delighted to say is that um, uh, our happiness or the numbers of people that are reporting as being happy um, has jumped back up to the top of the pile. You can see mid-March um, that took a serious dive. Um, uh, at some point, um, bored and stressed um, were, uh, were at the top. They've now taken a, uh, um, a step back, um, as has so there have been significant declines in the numbers of people that are scared. That's one reading um, of the nation's mood. But what we also track, um, and this is in conjunction with Imperial College London, um, is um, based on the um, PHQ4 and our behavioural data um, suggests that we should be concerned um, about the future, uh, the current and potentially the future mental health um, of not only the UK but also other nations. Um, we've been actually tracking this since about 2017 um, and to date, um, those um, on the scale who are reporting moderate or severe symptoms tracks typically around 18 to 21%. What we've seen in the latest of our behavioural data is that the UK is now at about 25% uh, reporting moderate or severe um, on the anxiety and depression um, uh, range. Now, um, we're not alone. Um, as you can see, we're clustered well with um, the US, with Japan um, uh, and, and various others. Germany is a standout, um, uh, down at 17%. But you can also see at the other end of the spectrum, particularly those um, nations that have been hard hit um, by coronavirus, Spain, Brazil and Italy, with around a third of the population reporting moderate or severe symptoms. So um, it, that is one to watch and, uh, and, and one to watch um, across audiences um, and how that plays out. Um, one, of the sim one of the causes um, potentially of anxiety um, is economic confidence or lack of. Um, what we are seeing in our data, and I'll start on the left-hand side of this, is that the vast majority of the UK population believes that the UK economy will be um, in a recession or depression in 12 months time. And that proportion is actually increasing over time. Uh, it was 65% uh, back in May. But it's not just uh, the UK economy, people are uh, also concerned uh, about the global economy. Uh, you can see on the chart here that 57% um, of people up to the end of last week 
um, were concerned about a global recession with about 25% very concerned about a global recession. Um, and that has uh, jumped um, since the end of April. But if that's the macro perspective, how does that actually translate to households? And what we see is a quarter of households are in a worse financial situation compared to last month. And the future doesn't look that much brighter either. The question that we ask is, um, compared to one month ago, how has your household financial situation changed? So we're just looking at a 30 day change there and 24% saying that they are worse off than uh, 30 days ago. Um, with a, a small, um, but uh, interesting 10% that say they are better off as a result. Um, and we'll come on to, uh, to look at that uh, in a little bit. But we also look at, okay, so how do you think your household's financial situation will change over the next 12 months? And surprisingly here, we always get uh, an increase in the don't knows and people sitting on the fence. Um, we've got an increase in the number of optimists, um, but we've also got a slight increase in the number of people who think they will be worse off um, in 12 months time. Um, we ask about job security. Um, and a third of people, or there are thereabouts, um, are feeling less secure in their job. And a number of, uh, uh, well, two in five um, have seen a reduction in business activity at their place of employment. Um, and I think what's, uh, what's interesting um, about those figures is, well, job security hasn't moved um, in since the beginning of May. What has moved um, has been the level of business activity. When we first started tracking this, um, when uh, this was back in the, uh, the start of May, um, when we asked that question, 48% of people had seen a decrease um, in their business activity in the last month. So what we are seeing is the early signs of business activity regenerating as lockdown loosens. So if that's people's household situ uh, uh, financial situation, their job security um, and their mental health, what's that actually doing um, in terms of how they are changing um, their financial behavior um, in the first instance? We can see actually, regardless of people's financial situation, um, uh, there is a um, significant number of people that are actively reducing non-essential uh, uh, expenses. Um, even um, uh, half of those who say they have improved their financial situation um, are actively reducing non-essential uh, expenses. Those that uh, are in a um, unfortunate and worse financial position, well, a third of those um, are relying on savings and depleting them. Um, and another 17% are uh, taking on more debt to cover expenses. Moving on um, to um, the next slide, what are people most concerned about um, in relation to finance? Um, and we ask a number of questions here. I've just pulled out some of the most interesting ones um, that I think. Um, the vast majority of people are concerned about local businesses failing. Um, uh, it's been tracking at somewhere between uh, about uh, the high 80s and low 80s um, since we've been tracking this, um, uh, but 84% being the latest figure last week. I'll come on to talk a little bit more about that um, as we get to the end and what consumers are doing as a result. Um, but I think some of the more worrying figures um, are these in, in the lower two lines on this chart looking at um, those who are concerned about being able to, one, pay their bills, um, latest wave 39%, but two, paying rent um, at 29%. 
And if we look um, at who those groups are that are worried about paying their bills um, and or their rent, um, they are slightly more um, uh, C2DE. Um, they are um, more likely to be parents. Um, and there's also an interesting pattern if you look across um, regions uh, of the UK. Now, although England, Scotland and Wales are relatively similar, hovering around 30%, what we are seeing is a large range, you know, separated between the southeast and the southwest, um, but between 37% and 24% of people um, in those areas that are worried about being able to pay their bills and or their rent. We also act, track um, not only perceptions of job security um, in our COVID monitor, but we also look at uh, what changes to employment um, people have undergone um, uh, recently. Uh, now, what we're looking at here is changes made to employment status um, due specifically to COVID-19. We do stipulate that um, uh, in the question um, between the 7th and the 21st of May. We're tracking furlough uh, at uh, about 22% uh, of workers at the moment um, with a uh, large um, uh, minority having also have other impacts, whether that be reduced hours, um, having to take unpaid leave, um, uh, or some form of change. Only 50% um, of people saying that there has been no change to their employment status. I think what will be interesting as well um, is as uh, the Chancellor is making statements shortly, uh, I believe, about uh, setting out details of how uh, employers are going to be asked to help support um, furlough schemes. Um, we'll see whether that, uh, when that furlough um, proportion changes, especially with the, um, with the introduction of, uh, of part-time. If we look at who has been furloughed, um, it tends to be younger people. Um, if we look at 18 to 24, it's 25 percent, as opposed to those who are 45 plus, which is around 19 percent. It tends to be those in lower social grades, um, those in uh, working in um, or in the DE social grade, it's 23 versus 15 percent at AB. Um, but what's also uh, interesting is um, looking around across the type of um, workplace that people uh, are in. Um, if people are already um, working from home or in a home office, um, then, uh, then only 11% of those people have been furloughed, um, compared to 26 who work in some form of collaborative workspace. Um, uh, unfortunately, I haven't got the data that sits underneath that in terms of what type of business that is, but it would certainly suggest it was certainly more agile, um, potentially a younger business. Um, uh, uh, you know, maybe we're looking more at startups there. But it's not all doom and gloom. Um, and uh, I never like to uh, uh, end on a, on a sour note. What we have, I did promise, at the, at the start we saw sort of some people that saying that they were actually in a better financial situation um, as a result of coronavirus. Um, uh, and that's certainly the case. 17% have been able to put more money into savings than they otherwise would. Um, and 10% uh, have said that the coronavirus outbreak has enabled them to pay off their debts. Um, now, when you actually dig into the reasons underlying that, it's of course because if they haven't had any changes to um, their income um, it, and because of lockdown it has forced them to curb uh, spending um, and as a result um, their uh, income has remained um, constant, um, their outgoings um, have decreased in which case they're in a much better financial situation. Um, it's not the majority by any stretch of the imagination um, but there is, a, uh, there, there is a minority out there um, who actually are better off. Um, I'd like to wrap um, by looking at some um, future behaviour. Um, and the first um, thing that I'd like to look at 
is with the announcements made uh, by the government uh, yesterday um, when they uh, outlined some easing of lockdown restrictions um, and uh, timetabled the opening of uh, some types um, of uh, shop, um, some, some form of retail um, or other um, business types. And what we asked was actually two weeks ago. So this data is a little older, um, but there's no reason to suggest that the rank order of these shouldn't be the same. But we asked people how comfortable they would feel um, visiting each um, of these following categories of um, business. Um, and um, what we can see is um, certainly those where you're in the open space, people feel much more comfortable um, than when you're in a more confined space, and especially gyms, um, where the vast majority of people um, uh, that um, we were asking um, either didn't, um, it, it didn't apply to them, but there was a, 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 of those that it did apply to, um, we saw that the vast majority um, felt uncomfortable um, returning to a gym. Um, similar for um, beauty and nail salons, um, and interestingly the same for pubs and bars, although of course pub gardens, where one is outdoors, people do, the, ma the majority of people that would go to this type of place um, do feel more comfortable. Um, so if, that, if, if that's comfort, we also look um, at um, forward-looking metrics in terms of latent demand. And within our brand index survey, um, we ask whether people are in market to purchase in a given category over a, a certain time period. Now that time period varies dependent on category. Um, uh, as is, uh, as is logical. So for example, um, fast foods and pubs, um, we look at a window of the next 30 days. Um, clothing and apparel, we look at over the next three months. Transport, we look at over the next six months. And flights and accommodation, we look at over the next 12 months. And the question is, um, you know, are you considering or are you in markets to purchase um, uh, in this um, category? Um, there's no surprise, uh, I think, that you can see that all of these, um, which have been heavily impacted sectors, have seen that uh, in markets uh, score drop and drop significantly. Um, what I think is slightly more worrying, especially for flights and travel and accommodation, is that especially given that we're looking over a 12 month window, um, is that that drop is, uh, is there and has been uh, sustained. Um, if we look at um, the, if we sort of focus in on travel and we look at uh, it across the world, we see a similar pattern. Um, so what we're showing here is that same in market metric um, for travel over the next 12 months, but we're looking at it by the UK, the US, Germany, Singapore, and Australia. Um, what you can see is the same um, drop month uh, after month in most cases. Um, the severity of that drop um, obviously differs by market. What I think is quite interesting is looking at the Australian data and that recent little bump um, in May. Um, now, it's, it's not significant. What we are seeing is a leveling off, um, but what will be very interesting is bringing in the June data. Um, and is that the early indication um, of because Australia have exited lockdown slightly faster and slightly earlier um, than, uh, than others? Is that a return of the travel market, or the early signs of it? Focusing in on the UK um, for travel and continuing with that, we're looking at um, uh, the percentage of UK adults very likely or likely to buy a flight in the next 12 months. 
And what we're showing in the purple line is that index across 2019. And what we're showing in the pink line um, is the 2020 data. So you can see that steady decline um, over recent months. And apologies, the, uh, the uh, axis hasn't um, appeared on here. But you can see that that's, uh, that is covering the whole of uh, the year. Um, and so that decline is from um, about March. But it's not necessarily all doom and gloom. Um, because one thing that we do track in our COVID-19 um, monitor uh, is uh, various attitude statements about whether people are, um, uh, it, or, or what their future behavior is likely to be, should I say. And what we are tracking in the UK is about 45% of people agreeing with, I can't wait to go on holiday or vacation overseas when restrictions um, allow. So um, th there might be nervousness, there might be um, people who consider themselves out of the market at the moment, um, but with 45% saying that they are, um, can't wait to go on holiday, um, that's, um, that means one of two things. Either it's a staycation and we're looking at uh, um, UK based holidays, um, or um, there is going to be a, a significant bounce in demand. Um, as people um, are allowed to travel. Away from travel, um, let's look at exercise. Um, uh, parks have been full of people um, uh, exercising over um, April and May. Um, and what we have seen is a reflection of that in YouGov data. We've seen a significant increase in people taking part in at least one session of exercise of 30 minutes um, in the last week. Um, that's, uh, that proportion has grown um, from about 60% to about 79% um, of the UK population. But what's also interesting is at the top end, um, if you look at those people exercising seven or more times a week, well, that's tripled. Um, from 5% in January to 15% um, of the population this last week in May. Um, will the trend continue? Um, who knows? Um, people might have found a new love um, of exercise, um, but uh, they also might uh, revert to their old ways. Um, unfortunately, I don't have um, forward-looking data on that. What we do have, however, um, is um, looking at, again, spend data on sports equipment and clothing, and that increase in amount of exercise being taken unfortunately hasn't translated um, into sales. Um, and what we are seeing, uh, if you're at the chart on the left hand side, is how likely are you to purchase um, sports products in the next three months? Um, whether the people are likely or very likely. So again, looking at that in-market data, um, which is forward-looking, and we've seen a steady decline in people saying that over the weeks of um, uh, 2020 compared to, and now tracking below, 2019 levels. And if you look at the reasons perhaps as to why that might be the case with this new love of sport, well, it's because of the type of exercise that people are taking. Um, it's walking or jogging, um, for which very little equipment uh, is actually required. Um, or it's the uh, nation following the new army of um, PE teachers online um, or, or following exercise videos. Um, that again um, require very little in terms of kit or equipment to exercise from your living room. Looking at some of the um, trends, the macro trends that have been going on um, over the last uh, couple of years, we've seen a increase in people working from home where they can um, over recent years, um, but that trend has been accelerated and very much looks set to continue. We ask people whether they uh, uh, agree or disagree with various statements um, in our COVID-19 economic recovery tracker. Um, and one of them in particular is, I want to work from home a lot more as a result of coronavirus. And 38% of people are agreeing with that. 
that 38% um, is the same 38% I'm showing here on the far right of this chart. Um, but I, well, I thought it was interesting to show the, uh, the trend on that because we've been tracking it since the beginning of April. Um, and if you'd asked people um, in April, around 50% of them uh, would have said that they would want to work from home more. Um, but uh, perhaps enthusiasm for working from home as uh, lockdown has gone on has waned slightly um, uh, and has fallen back. What hasn't moved uh, significantly is um, people saying that they agree with the statement of I will travel much less for work, um, which is tracking at about a third um, of workers. Earlier in, uh, in, in this chart uh, and presentation, I talked about um, people concerned for local businesses um, and in particular businesses failing. And one of the um, statements that people most agree with um, in our tracking is um, that they will support local businesses and buy local in the future. Many people have been forced to do that or they've done it as a result of convenience, finding their local um, suppliers um, and they will continue to do that in the future, which I think is, um, is a really interesting one. That one has stayed uh, continuously um, atop of the pile um, at 63% uh, at or there or thereabouts over the course of our tracking. Um, the other macro trend um, that seems to have been supercharged by coronavirus is around digital payment. Um, about half of the population say that they will use cash less in the future. Um, this was a hypothesis and we'd heard anecdotally um, that this was happening um, very, very early on, um, uh, even before um, contactless payment in the UK was uh, increased in terms of value um, uh, and retailers started putting up um, screens. Um, we certainly saw a significant, um, uh, or anecdotally we're hearing, um, a, a huge reduction in cash. I think this, this proves it out. Um, and actually the use of cash or, or agreement with this, that I will use cash less, um, is growing very steadily um, as, uh, uh, as this pandemic goes on. Uh, when we first started tracking this, it was just under 40% and every single wave, it's increased by about 2% um, consistently. Um, the other one, um, of course, is, uh, is online shopping. Um, some people being uh, forced into this, um, some people, um, uh, some businesses, it's the only route or has been the only route um, to transact with customers um, of recent time. But people are saying that they like it, or a third of them um, are certainly saying that, and that they will make more use of online shopping delivery um, in the future as a result of the coronavirus. So that was a very quick tour, it's spot on time at 45 minutes um, uh, of our data. Um, and what we are seeing is some of the key stories so far um, from across our brand index data, our profiles data, across our COVID-19 tracking data um, and other sources. Um, uh, before um, we close though, what I will do is just give you a reminder, um, if you do have any questions, um, please do put them in the chat. I can see um, uh, several coming through and Mickey and I will come back to them uh, in just a minute's time or so and try and run through um, some of those. In the meantime, while I give you um, a minute or so to think about those, um, let me just uh, um, tell you about what's coming next um, from YouGov. Um, we are um, developing our economic recovery module to our COVID-19 tracking. Um, that's going to see an overhaul um, in the next uh, three weeks. Um, we're going to uh, enlarge the data set and look at how we can improve it further. Um, so if you do have any feedback um, on our um, economic recovery module, um, we'd be delighted to hear it. Please do contact your account manager or um, email us at info at yougov.com. 
Um, in a couple of weeks time, um, I'll be back here with uh, our UK Head of Account Management, Amelia Brody, um, and we'll be uh, giving you a full update um, across all of our COVID tracking, um, looking at consumer behavior, um, looking at consumer consumption, an update on economic confidence. Um, so please do tune in for that. Um, and next week, um, uh, YouGov is also running a series of um, connected trackers. We've had a call from clients to say, how can we improve tracking? Um, how can you use all of your connected data um, to improve things like our brand tracking solutions? Um, we're launching some new, uh, new products um, and some new ideas. So if you are interested um, in those, please do tune in um, and contact your local account team um, for uh, details of when that is. Right. Um, uh, putting our um, email address on the screen there. Um, so if you do have any questions after this webinar um, uh, that you think oh, should have asked that um, or would just like to get in touch with us, please in the first instance um, email your local um, account manager. Um, but if you don't have one, um, by all means do email us at info at yougov.com. Right, um, your questions have been coming in um, and I'm going to welcome um, Mickey Stacy um, in here. He's been looking at your questions uh, as they've been coming in. Um, Mickey, have you found anything um, of particular interest? Yes. Hello everyone. Um, as Will said, I'm uh, Mickey Stacy and I've run the Marketing Insights team. Basically, I'm one of the marketing data geeks that we have. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of the questions and um, give you some answers based on what we've found from our data. So I'm going to um, kind of say, take two questions that are on a similar topic together to start with. So the first question is what percentage bought local before the pandemic? Um, and the, the second question, which is on a, a similar theme, is in the retailer analysis, do you have in any indication of perception change for community stores or local stores, such as co-op or local CTNs, etc.? Um, and uh, they've gone on to specifically say they're thinking of the shift uh, to local or community that seems to be the theme of um, some media. So a few points we have on this. Um, I guess, first of all, I think one of those questions came in before we had the slide about um, one of the big trends that we're expecting for the future is people shifting towards shopping more local. So that's certainly something we have data to support. It's one of the, the main things that people are agreeing with in, in, our, in our new tracker. Um, we also, so you mentioned co-op here specifically, we could, we could have added co-op into that, one of those early initial slides where we looked at the big four grocery retailers um, because co-op specifically also managed to create some some nice kind of positive sentiment around the brand um i think they were one of the first few to commit to hiring new staff so that also um coincided with an uplift in in several brand metrics so co-op specifically could could easily have gone into that mix um in terms of uh kind of community stores or maybe more more general local shopping we published an article in mid-april with with some good stats um that showed that within the first few weeks of lockdown people were shifting to use corner shops much more than they had done previously um and so that gives us a good good idea then of what shifts were happening so we know that people did shift to use local stores more and they're expecting to do to do more so in the future um and a, a final point on this Last week, we did actually run run a webinar that looked at um, the grocery sector specifically, and we had um, a guest speaker from um, Cost Cutter. So if you are interested to learn more about what we've published and what we've put out on the grocery sector specifically, it might be worth going back to, to have a look at that webinar. Thank you. Um, Fantastic. Will. Thank you, Mickey. Um, uh, is there uh, several other questions um, coming in um, some of them that uh, I will be able to answer, some that I'm not going to. Um, um, Mickey, there's there's one I've also seen um, that's come into info at yougov.com um, about um, uh, brand index and its uh, its scope um, internationally. Um, I'll come to you in a minute 
on that, um, if I may. But in the meantime, um, do we know if employers are more likely to offer working from home options post COVID-19? Um, do we know if companies might rent smaller office spaces in central London in the future? Do you know, it's a really, really interesting question. Um, uh, one that we will be putting um, to our, um, uh, our B2B um, uh, audiences on the panel, um, uh, as well as, if I may uh, answer at the same time, um, something about are people willing to go back to work in offices. Um, uh, I'm aware that office workers are only a, uh, uh, you know, a proportion of the population, it's by no means um, you know, everyone works in office, um, but it is a really interesting question around will um, will office workers want to return? We're seeing about a third of them um, uh, want to work from home more. Um, we uh, are seeing that um, people are reluctant um, to use uh, public transport, in particular those in London, um, uh, around the tube. Um, uh, and so they sort of, they, it would point towards, um, although we don't have precise data on, um, are you going to return to an office? Um, but uh, we'll definitely come back to you on that um, uh, as and when those questions are asked. Um, Mickey, the one coming in to um, info at um, uh, You've referenced a lot of brand index data um, and it certainly looks interesting. Um, it's for the UK and you showed uh, Germany um, and the US and Singapore and Australia. Um, where else do we have coverage of it? Thanks. Yeah, we've, um, so the UK specifically, we um, look at 40 different sectors or industries. And then um, the, the same platform uh, runs around the world with 40 different markets. So we've got a really good coverage around the world for kind of essentially any areas you'd w want to look into. And a fair amount of what we've presented today has has come out of um, has come out of brand index. So it allows you to get a really good measure of what's happening on on kind of multiple industries um, around the world. So hopefully, hopefully that helps answer that question there. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mickey, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've seen anything else that grabs your attention um, in our question list here. Um, one more there is that's come in, which is how could non-essential brands or categories continue to engage or stay relevant? Um, so I think there's some, obviously my answer is going to be to understand your consumer better. Um, but I think some of the stuff we've presented today supports that and goes well with it so um for example with those same in-market trackers that we've we've got from brand index here none of the industries even the ones that have been kind of hardest hit have hit zero so none of them have gone down to having nobody wanting to buy and having nobody there so i think it comes down to looking into understanding who your audience is how you can reach them and kind of essentially what's going to motivate them to buy now that now that um, times might be a bit tougher. Fantastic. Mickey, thank you very much indeed. Um, we're going to wrap it up there. Um, so thank you very much um, for your time. Mickey, thank you very much. Um, and a, a huge thank you also to our marketing team um, who do a tremendous job um, behind the scenes in organising all of this. Um, so um, with that, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon um, and an even better weekend. From all of us at YouGov, goodbye.